Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining. This is our last car seminar uh, and before the Easter holidays. And I have the great pleasure to introduce today Professor Stephen Bulbus. Uh, Stephen got his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, uh, and then went on to have faculty positions at the University of Virginia, ENS in Paris, and since 2012 has been civilian professor um, of astronomy at the University of Oxford. Um, I think most of us already know him and his work. For those that don't, Stephen's an expert in theoretical studies of plasma physics, especially instabilities and accretion disks and other complex phenomena. And today he will be presenting some work on accretion disks around black holes and TDRs, uh, TDEs, I should say. TDEs. Thank you, please. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> thank you, Steve. Okay, thank you, Robert. Let's see if I, I'm going to bring up, go to the full screen. I'm going to talk today about um, time-dependent accretion disks, and that'll be an important part of this. Um, not sure where that's coming from. Time-dependent accretion disks around Kerr black holes and how they are, they become increasingly useful as a diagnostic for tidal disruption events. And the work that I'll be describing today has been done with, and in very many instances, actually really led by my former student, Andrew Mummery, uh, now a Leverhulme postdoc uh, at Oxford. So I think it's fair to say that modern accretion disk theory really began um, as kind of a proxy, as a search for evidence of black holes. Black holes were what everyone was after in the late 60s and 1970s, and the evidence for them was pretty tenuous. So accretion disk theory really began um, and came into existence as a way for us to understand how black holes influence their surroundings and by that process betraying the properties of the black hole itself. So the classical work that goes back to the very beginnings of steady state disk theory is that of Shakura and Sunyayev. You'll notice the title that I have reproduced here, Black Holes and Binary Systems, Observational uh, Appearance, doesn't mention a disk at all. The key uh, astronomical feature that they were um, focusing on was the black hole itself. Nevertheless, these are, of course, this, the fundamental basic property or the basic model of disks that people use are still called to this day Shakura Sinyayev disks. The idea is that the disk is thin so that it is rotationally supported. That means that the rotational velocity, this r times omega, which I've, uh, which you see here, that is uh, a very large velocity compared to the speed of sound or the thermal velocity of the gas itself. And correspondingly, the disk thickness h is very small compared to the radial location. And that will become sort of marginal in the innermost parts of the disk, but it's a good approximation throughout the bulk of the disk. The disk is supported um, in the radial direction, as I say, by rotational support, but the vertical structure of the disk is supported both by a combination of thermal pressure and magnetic pressure. So a very brief history of thin disk theory post SS33, post the Shakura Sunyayev uh, era. Um, Linden Bell and Pringle made a fundamental contribution by developing the time dependent theory of disks. And that can be very important because in many systems and in particular, certainly for the tidal disruption events we'll be talking about later in the talk, the time dependence is a absolutely key part of the analysis. Um, if we want to study the region of the disk near the black hole, then we need to study relativistic theory when the orbital velocity becomes comparable to the speed of light. And that was developed actually in the same year of Shakur and Sunyayev by Novikov and Thorne, and then Page and Thorne a little bit later who worked through the algebra to its finality. Relativistic time-dependent disk theory, which we need for tidal disruption events, 
seemed to be completely absent from the literature when I started to look at this problem a few years ago. And I was a bit surprised, but I, I just I couldn't find it anywhere. So I developed the theory and wrote it up. And I'll talk about it actually in just a, a few moments. And I was very surprised when at a conference, somebody came up to me and said, oh, no, it had already been done. And sure enough, in a paper by actually two quite well-known disc theorists, Doug Erdley and Alan Lightman, back in 1975, on a paper which had nothing to do with relativistic disks, it was a paper that was looking at magnetized disks. And in an appendix, uh, it was like appendix three or four in the paper, there was simply a quotation of what the equation was without any derivation and said, oh, by the way, in case you're interested, there's this. And it kind of lay dormant there for 40 years. Uh, until, well, I guess I can say I brought it back uh, and uh, applied it to tidal disruption events, which is a really very natural venue for this. Happily, and it wasn't easy to tell, but happily we did agree we got the same answer because we used different coordinate systems. I actually had to do a bit of work to convince myself that everything was okay. So I'm going to talk about the 2017 paper in this talk. So let's look at the disk evolution equations, sort of fundamentals of this. I'm gonna set up my standard cylindrical coordinate systems that you see here. And here we have with the background disk, kind of cheating a little bit, that's a, I took that from a picture of a, a galaxy. And the idea is that the disk is turbulent. Now, standard disk theory always models this as a viscosity, and for some purposes, that's okay. Um, but it's not a good idea any more than you would describe, say, the convection zone of the sun as an enhanced thermal conduction process. You really shouldn't describe uh, the turbulence as an enhanced viscosity because the fluctuations actually can be an important part both of the observations and the theory. So what I'm going to present to you here, I think is a somewhat, um, uh, uh, well, what can I say? I think it's a, it's a better way to look at it where angular momentum comes about through the fact that turbulent correlations in a disk are correlated with one another. So the idea is that if I have a an azimuth of velocity, which I write as r omega plus the fluctuation delta v phi. And I have a radial velocity, which I'm just writing as v plus the fluctuation delta v r. And the idea that r omega is a very large quantity, delta v phi and delta v r are the fluctuations, and they are one asymptotic order smaller and then the V, the mean radial drift velocity, is yet another asymptotic order smaller than the fluctuations. So the ordering is, as you see, R omega is much bigger than the RMS delta V velocities, which are in turn much, much larger than the radial drift velocity. And then if I look at VR, V phi, which is a measure of the angular momentum transport, if I really wanted to measure the angular momentum, I would multiply that by R and multiply that in turn by the density. But if I uh, form that quantity and then average it over time, I'll get two contributions. One will be R omega, which is a kind of a zeroth order velocity, the rotation velocity, times V, the drift velocity, that's second order. And then the other contribution will be the product of delta VR and delta V phi. So that's the product of two first order terms, which in turn is also second order in the amplitudes. And those two terms, 
are comparable. And the R omega V term is what Donald Lindenbell used to call Lorry transport. That's the direct kind of driving of the angular momentum being delivered. And because V is inward, that actually takes angular momentum inward. But the delta VR, delta V phi, that product of the correlations, which we give the name W, W R phi, it has two subscripts, R and phi. So we think of it as a tensor. And that is the outward transport associated with the turbulence itself. And that's what people think of as viscosity. The fundamental equations are very simple. We have one equation, which is mass transport. And sigma here is the surface density. It's the integrated surface density or column density of the disk. R sigma V, you can see, is just the mass flux. And then the second equation is an, an equation of angular momentum conservation. And it too is written in the same form. There's a D by DT of an angular momentum density, sigma R squared and omega. R squared and omega don't depend on time, so they can, can, they can come out of the derivative and then a divergence of the angular momentum flux, which you see in the second term. And those are the only ingredients that one needs to actually formulate an evolving disk equation. The idea is that we look at the angular momentum equation and we eliminate the velocity V from the angular momentum equation and substitute it back in the mass equation and when we do that, we get a rather nice diffusion-like equation for the surface density of the disk. And this is the fundamental evolutionary equation that Lyndon Bell derived from viscous theory back in 74. And back in 1999, John Papaloizu and I gave a derivation of the equation just based on looking at the fluctuations very similar to what I'm talking about here. In a real disk, you have fluctuations that correlate with one another, not only through the sort of kinematic velocities, but the angular, excuse me, the magnetic fields in the radial and the azimuthal directions are also correlated. So in the slide itself, you see a VAR and a VA phi, so that stands for the alphane velocities, the velocities that uh, are associated with magnetic tension along the field line, and also are very important for angular momentum transport in disks. Then the final equation on this slide tells me how the energy is actually dissipated. So sigma, the surface density, times this WR phi, this correlated fluctuations, multiplied by the shear in the disk. So this is often called the stress by strain relationship. That tells me how rapidly energy is being taken from the free energy of the shear in the disk. And then the minus 2F that you see on the right-hand side assumes that that energy, which is being extracted from the disk shear is being thermalized and radiated away. So the F is the energy flux that's being uh, emitted, that's being lost from the disk, hence the minus sign and the factor of two from both sides. And that's part of a much more general formula. Tij is what you often see it uh, written as a stress tensor in the fluid literature times a gradient of the velocity that tells me how rapidly I'm extracting energy from the shear. And then the emissivity is in this case two sigma t to the fourth. So it's just radiating like a black body with an effective surface temperature of Tf. So notice that the equation that we've derived here is a stable diffusion equation. 
that's good. You want your you want your fundamental equation to be stable, um, because that r squared omega prime, the prime there. I'm sorry, I should have said that is uh, simply a a radial uh, derivative. And in Newtonian gravity, the angular momentum increases outward. So r squared omega is a, or the, the gradient r squared omega is always positive, and the disk tends to spread with time. What is interesting is that in general relativity, life gets a little bit more interesting because near the black hole, r squared omega actually, or the angular momentum starts to increase inward, not increase outward. And that changes the property of the equation completely. And in fact, to the point where we can't even use the assumptions that went into this about which velocities are bigger than others. So the theory breaks down. That doesn't mean you should give up, but it does mean that you have to change the theory. But we're going to focus on the bulk of the disk for now, in which case we're going to assume that we have a stable spreading disk. And I should point out, because I'll refer to it later, that the innermost orbit which for which r squared omega is positive, or just barely touches zero, that's called the innermost stable circular orbit, ISCO, or ISCO. So here's an example of the kinds of solutions that emerge from this. This shows, uh, this is taken from a long time ago, a paper, Pringles Review article, 1981. And the interesting thing is that the disk doesn't just flow inwards. There are regions of the disk, especially early on, which are flowing in, inward. Substantial part of the disk is flowing outward, but ultimately the disk accretes entirely in the center and only a vanishingly small fraction of the disk goes off to infinity, where it nevertheless takes up all the angular momentum of the disk. You send all the angular momentum to infinity and all the mass to the center of the disk, and that is the ultimate goal for what accretion is trying to do. So, if you don't know general relativity, I apologize for this. You can sort of glaze over because I can give you a description later on. If you'd like to see a little bit of the details, then you'll indulge me. I'll, I'll just speak for sort of a couple of minutes on where the relativistic theory comes from. So the idea is that we have a line element, uh, a metric that is a generalization of the Minkowski metric. You remember the minus c squared dt squared plus the spatial part ds squared. In general relativity, that becomes much more, well, general. And there is a variation, a curvature, which is induced by the point mass, which is either a Schwarzschild black hole or in what I've written down on this slide, the a, um, a Kerr black hole, which has a rotation. So I'm using units where the speed of light is one. I'm assuming I'm in the disk midplane. So the angle theta is pi over two. For those of you who are more familiar with the general boyer lindquist coordinates for these Kerr black holes, and the Schwarzschild radius, which I've written Rs, is 2gm over c squared, but c is 1 here, so just 2gm in this notation. And you get some idea. There's a lot of kind of algebraic content to it. It's kind of messy to work with. I draw your attention to u mu. This is, this is the 4 velocity. dx mu is the coordinate differential d tau is the invariant, the co-moving time. And I draw your attention as well to the distinction between the contravariant u mu and the covariant u mu with the subscript written downstairs. 
and that is simply the matrix multiplication, if you will, of g mu nu, the metric tensor, with the four velocity u mu, and as always, summing over the repeated index mu. Now, this u mu with the mu written downstairs, covariant mu is important because these are the quantities which um, represent the um, conserved, how do I want to say, the constants of the motion. U0 is an energy constant, and U5 is an angular momentum constant. A little bit more mathematics. I'll just go through it quickly in, in the notation that I'm using. G will be the determinant of the metric. That's simply R to the fourth. It's a radial variable. If I'm using spherical, it's R squared. If I'm using cylindrical coordinates, that's what I'm using. If I'm discussing a vector, A mu, the Cartesian divergence I've written as a partial mu, A mu. In more general coordinates, of course, I need to take that divergence and write it as a gradient and take the dot product with a particular direction, E mu, and then it operates on the entire vector. And then only afterwards do I project in the E nu direction. So that is referred to as a covariant derivative. And in general relativity, I will be dealing entirely with these kinds of divergences when I make mu and nu the same in the uh, derivative operation that corresponds to a covariant divergence. And it's just the familiar things like the one over r squared d by dr of r squared, those kinds of terms when you take a divergence in spherical coordinate, we do the same things in the geometry associated with the black holes. Um, and I'll repeat again, because it's important in disk theory, U phi, with the subscript written downstairs, corresponds to angular momentum in general relativity, and it's a conserved quantity in the Kerr metric. So what do the fundamental general relativity equations look like? Well, you know, they look they look a little bit more complicated when you write them down, but they're really just exactly the same thing that Lyndon Bell and Pringle did back in 1974. So the first equation is a conservation of particle current. Uh, basically, the number of particles is conserved. It's not created. Particles are not created or destroyed. And then I write down the second line here is a T mu nu. So that's a very general momentum stress tensor. And that's the T, there's a T mu phi, which will correspond to an angular momentum uh, tensor. It's angular momentum transport. And that has a bunch of terms in it. If you've studied it in special relativity, it'll look rather familiar. There's a part which is proportional to the metric tensor and the pressure. And then there's a rho plus p. If we put back the speed of light, it would be rho plus p over c squared times the four velocity. And then when we actually study disks in relativity, we have to pay attention as well to the radiation, not just the energy carried off by the radiation, but actually the angular momentum carried off by the radiation is very important in the inner edges of the disk. And then the final equation, this T mu phi, with the covariant derivative uh, and summing over the mu index here, um, that simply represents the fact that angular momentum is conserved. So I'm using exactly the same two equations as in Newtonian theory, conservation of particles, conservation of angular momentum to derive my fundamental equation in general relativity. The idealizations we make is that the disk is thin. In this sense, it's 
spool, we ignore pressure compared with rotation. The disc is once again radially supported by rotation, and we won't worry about the vertical structure here. The velocity field, once again, is a mean plus a fluctuation, and the R phi components of the velocities, those velocities are correlated with one another. If VR is positive, then on average, the fluctuation V phi is also positive. If, I guess I've written them as U's here, so I should call them U's. If UR is negative, then U phi on average will also tend to be negative so that the correlation, the product of the two will be a positive quantity for outward transport. Also notice when we do relativity, I'm a little bit more careful where I put my subscripts and superscripts. So I'm treating the UR, <clears throat> excuse me, as a four velocity. The U phi, where I put the subscripts as a subscript, <laughs> that is actually an angular momentum now. And WR phi is written in this funny way as well. The R goes up and the phi goes down. So that's just sort of a technical point. Uh, in the equations which I'll show you, all the U's will be assumed to be mean flows. And the equation is integrated over height. So there's what the actual equation looks like. It actually looks somewhat similar to what we found from Newtonian theory. Instead of R's, we have the square root of G, but that's gonna turn out to be the same thing for the metric that I'm working with in the midplane. The square root of G is just going to be R basically. And then I have, interestingly enough, a second term in my equation for the angular momentum, the conservation of that comes out of the conservation of angular momentum, where I'm keeping track of the angular momentum that is carried off in radiation. So it looks like a much more complicated beast. I have this second term. But in fact, when I go through all of the details, a sort of a this is kind of a miracle that happens. So here's my F, Fz. This is actually the, the actual energy carried off by the radiation. And it's very easy to turn that into the angular momentum by dividing by C squared and then multiplying by U phi. And the this rather complicated equation is basically the same thing which I have talked about before. It is the stress by strain relationship, this U phi over U zero. That's just essentially the angular velocity, the omega that I had before. And the U zero here, just to remind you, is the time component of the four velocity. So it's dt d tau. It's the time interval by the coordinate time that someone at infinity would measure divided by d tau, which is the co-moving time. So different clocks are involved. But the basic formulation is absolutely the same. The only difference is that we need to keep track of the additional angular momentum loss. And that's what the equation looks like. We define it in terms of y, which is basically, think of this as r times w times sigma. And then I have this funny second term over here, which takes into account the losses that are carried off by the radiation. But within the theory of relativity, it's actually possible to simplify this further because the U phi and the U zero velocities are not entirely independent of one another. So at the end of the day, well, actually, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. Notice we have in this equation for the evolution of the disk, the U phi primed, which is the angular momentum gradient. 
And at the innermost stable orbit, the ISCO, that goes to zero, which means we need to be careful with the mathematics of this equation in a way that we didn't have to be when we were doing Newtonian theory. Now, interestingly enough, okay, so here I am, I keep getting distracted by myself. I've plotted for you here, the angular momentum profile in black is the Newtonian R squared omega, and in purple is the Schwarzschild U phi. So the innermost stable circular orbit occurs at a radius of six. 6 gm over c squared, 6 gravitational radii. Not the event horizon, but three times the Schwarzschild radius where the event horizon is. So it's 6 gm over c squared, or 3 r sub s. Okay. For circular orbits, it turns out that you can collapse this down if I instead of work with y, I work with y over u0, dt d tau. That second term, if I go back, that second term, the u phi u0 omega prime y, that rather ugly looking thing, that turns out to be collapsible. So the actual final equation, when I work in the right variables, looks essentially exactly exactly like the Newtonian equation, except for this funny factor of the different times, the u zeros. But otherwise, it really is very, very similar. And if you actually plot u zero over the disk surface, you notice it hardly varies from one. And there only when I get very near the innermost stable inner edge of the disk, where it goes up to 1.3. So all of this work for actually very little effect, but you keep it in keep it in the equation because the physics demands it, but as a practical matter, uh, it's a lot of work for not a whole lot of return, but that's what you have to do. So there is our reduced equation. And I just wanted to say our motivation here for carrying th you through all this. So thank you for your patience. Um, our motivation here is to understand tidal disruption events. So what is a tidal disruption events? Well, these occur because in galaxies, occasionally a star can pass very close to a central massive black hole, at which point either it'll be swallowed whole and you won't see anything, or it will continue on its orbit, or very possibly, if you just manage to hit things exactly right, it will become close enough to the central black hole that the tidal disruption will tear the star apart in a very energetic event, which is comparable to a supernova in terms of its brightness. It releases the entire binding energy of the star. And Martin Rees was the first one to look at this back in 1988 and even do kind of a, how shall I put it, a very basic analysis, uh, which was taken as the theory of tidal disruption events for many decades until we got better at it. So here is a NASA promotional film for, for their test satellite, which is a transit instrument. And that is supposed to look for uh, planets from transiting planets, but it's also very good in the optical for finding these tidal disruption events. So this is, I think, more of an artist's conception than it is an actual numerical simulation. But you see the main point here, that once the star gets disrupted, the end of the process is a disk. The beginning of the, of the process is a bit of a, it's a bit of a train wreck and it's rather difficult to analyze. But at the end of the day, what you'll be left with is an evolving relativistic disk. And that's what we want to study. So the Riesian theory of what the light curve of a tidal disruption event should look like uh, 
is very simple um, because he made very simple assumptions. He assumed that the luminosity would be directly proportional to the mass accretion rate, maybe an efficiency factor times m dot c squared. But if L is proportional to dm dt, we write that as dm de, where E is the energy of a particle, times the velocity times de dr. That's how we write the de dt part. He assumed that there was equal mass in equal energy intervals just a general equipartition argument. The velocity he took to be Keplerian, one over R to the one half, and DEDR is just the derivative of one over R or one over R squared. So if we put that together, that meant that L, the luminosity would scale with distance is R to the minus five halves. And then because Keplerian scaling in free fall tells us that R goes like T to the two thirds. That translates into a T to the minus five thirds light curve with a nice distinctive power law for what we would expect from tidal disruption events. And so for many years, that was simply taken as the hallmark signature of a tidal disruption event, T to the minus five thirds. And knowing what they wanted to find, the initial observations seem to, how shall I say, they seem to confirm that. But as instruments became better and analyses became better, it became clear that they weren't really finding T to the minus five thirds. Uh, it was much more shallow. And in point of fact, when you worked out the theory of what a disk should give you for its bolometric luminosity, and we need to distinguish between looking at the disk in x-rays and looking at it bolometrically at all wavelengths, the characteristic exponent for a bolometric luminosity in a pioneering study done by Canizo, Lee, and Goodman back in 1990 gave something closer to t to the minus 19 sixteenths for an accretion disk, assuming various uh, simplifying uh, ideas for the opacity. Something that was a little bit bigger than one in the exponent, not five thirds. And in fact, if you do the same calculation for a finite stress at the ISCO, you find that L goes like T to the minus 11 quarters uh, in these alpha disk models. And that means if you take it seriously, that it doesn't even converge with time. So this would represent kind of a, uh, a transitory behavior while the disk is expanding and spreading. So the point is, is that minus five thirds is really not a hallmark for what the tidal disruption event should be doing. Um, and real life with the disk is a bit more complicated. In fact, when you look at the data, and we have very good data now, power laws, just a power law is not a good description for the X-ray emission from a tidal disruption event. So let's talk now about actually confronting the theory with the observations. So let's talk about the spectral evolution of tidal disruption events in both broad band passes like X-rays and the narrow band pass filters that observers like to use for UV and optical measurements. So the idea here, we have our observer who is set up with a little eyeball that you can see and he's his coordinates are alpha and beta and he's looking down on the disk from an angle. And the actual flux which is coming out of the disk, I've written kind of semi-quantitatively in the form of an integral over the black bodies at each radius. So that's this h nu zero over 
KB, the Boltzmann constant, and then T. And uh, this integral that I've written down conceals a lot of technical complexity. People who work with photospheres know that you put in color corrections. So all of that is in there, but basically the idea is I'm integrating both over the solid angle d theta naught, and I'm integrating over the frequency bandpass. This 0.3 keV to 10 keV is the bandpass for the SWIFT satellite. So there is sort of symbolically the kind of calculation that we're doing, and we're doing it, of course, in per geometry. So in principle, you need to do this numerically because it's a complicated integral. However, we are kind, we get kind of lucky, and I'm going to sort of illustrate why. I'm going to go back to Newtonian theory so you can see this kind of written out in more detail. So look for the moment at this little white box here, which gives the evolution of a Newtonian disk as a function of time. And the point is, is that there's a very sharp temperature maximum. And that means because of this Planckian exponential, which is in the disk, most of the radiation is coming from a very small region in the disk near that temperature maximum. And therefore, it is possible mathematically to simplify that integral considerably just by looking in the neighborhood of that very, very sharp temperature maximum. And we need to do that when we look at the, in the x-ray portions because we really are sensitive only to the very innermost parts of the disk Everything else is being exponentially cut off. So for the Newtonian theory, we can even write down exactly, very, very precisely, what the temperature profile looks like. And then, oh, I apologize for sort of perhaps putting in a bit too much detail, but basically what you can do is take that exponential and then that dominates everything. And that then that e to the h nu over kt minus one, we can replace with an e to the minus h nu over kt. t, of course, is a function of radius, but we expand that exponential very, very near the temperature maximum, and everything can be done analytically. Five minutes, Stephen. Five minutes. Oh! Yep. <laughs> if, oh, all right. Roughly, roughly. I, I th thank you for that. I will speed up. So I apologize, I can take questions if there's more. So what I want to say is that at the end of the day, we can actually get expressions for the flux. And because we also know the temperature is a function of time, because we have solved the evolution equation, we actually have an analytic form for what the light curve should look like. So depending upon exactly what assumptions we make about the innermost part of the disk, we get something which is basically a power law in time times an exponential of an e to the minus the square root of that power law. That's what emerges from that. And that actually fits the X-ray light curves remarkably well. So I'm gonna kind of skip through and show you some data from a well-known, well-observed TDE, Assassin 14 LI, which was observed over a three-year period, both in the X-rays and the ultraviolet. So here is the X-ray light curve, and here are some fits. This is the best fit power law, which doesn't do particularly well. There is a best fit exponential, and then our disk model in blue when we fit it to early times, actually does quite a nice job at later times as well. And here we compare the actual uh, calculation totally numerically with our analytic model, and they essentially lie one on top of the other, which makes it very, very convenient 
for the data analysis. And the fit to the data, as you can see, is really quite excellent. This is a, an example which shows a vanishing stress in red versus a finite stress in the inner edge. And the point is, is that the finite inner edge does a much better job than the vanishing stress, although the vanishing stress model is still used by many uh, when they actually fit the data. In fact, the vanishing stress is used by other groups who don't even do a time-dependent theory. They take a sequence of steady state models, which I think is uh, in, introduces problems that a full evolutionary model can avoid. Now, this is interesting. This is a simultaneous fit of the X-rays on top and then three different UV bands as a function of time from 200 days out to 1400 days. The X-rays are being exponentially cut off whereas the UV bands are plateauing. And that is absolutely a signature of an accretion disk. And I'm just gonna, I'll have to end with this because I'm running out of times, but you can see what's going on. Here is the full disk spectrum at 200 days, 500 days, and so on, up to 7,000 days. The X-ray band is shown in purple, and you can see it's quickly, the disk is cooling and it quickly passes through the X-ray bands uh, and is exponentially cut off. The UV bands that I've shown you, the blue, the green, and the red, are very narrow. And look at what the X, excuse me, what the disk curves are doing over that same time period. While the X-rays are falling rapidly out of their band pass, the very narrow band passes in the UV are unchanged because the disk spectra are cooling, but also the peak is shifting to the left in such a way that there's hardly any change at all. So the fact that we see this very unusual behavior and we can fit it simultaneously, I think is an excellent indication that what we're looking at there is a disk. And we can independently deduce the properties of the black hole. 2 million solar masses, a spin of 0.75, and even a disk mass, although it's not very tightly constrained, which is surprisingly small, about 10 to the minus two solar masses, indicating we're probably just looking at not the entire star, but the residue that's left over in the final disk. And this is, I'm just gonna pass that because this is quite interesting. This is the mass of the black holes now that we've done through the study of several tidal disruption events as a function of host galaxy mass or correlated with host galaxy mass, the gray are stellar dynamical models, the blue are TDE models. And what they show is that we are seem to be picking up the same population, only we're much more sensitive to the host galaxies which are more difficult to observe by uh, stellar spectroscopy me methods. All right, I better close up. So there's a bunch of things I didn't get a chance to talk about. So I'm gonna pop through those and get to my conclusions before I wear out my welcome. Ooh, a lot of stuff. Ah, there we are. One, conclusion one, TDEs, I hope I've convinced you are an interesting laboratory to test the dynamics of classical disk theory and relativistic disk theory. General relativistic disks violate the Rayleigh stability criterion at the innermost stable circular orbits. They produce bolometric power law light curves with T going or L going like T to the minus N, N less than one is typical for a finite ISCO inner stress and bigger than one is typical for a vanishing ISCO stress. But when we look at X-rays, uh, power laws are not the best way to describe it. There's a much better way which emerges from applying this evolutionary disk theory. And we can simultaneously fit both the X-rays and the ultraviolet and optical measurement with the same object.
I should emphasize for those sort of outside the field, that's rather unusual. Uh, people who do modeling tend to invoke different components for the UV and the X-rays. What I'm pushing and what Andy and I are arguing for is that you're basically looking at a time evolving disk, which I think makes a great deal of physical sense. X-ray light curves should have a rather generic form. And we're looking at the V portion of the spectrum, modified slightly because we have more than one temperature present. We have a narrow band of temperatures around the temperature maximum, but there's a very distinctive shape that emerges from the theory that can be analyzed or that can be applied to tidal disruption events. Disk theory, uh, as we've constructed it, is actually quite happy with rather detailed observations. And I've shown you just one in this talk, but by now we have dozens of such TDEs that we've applied this to, which is why I could show you some of the observational uh, sort of population studies of the black holes. I mean, hope is that this will be, this will become a standard diagnostic tool. And I didn't get a chance to talk about this, but there's interesting physics inside of the ISCO that we've, some theoretical work, uh, we've deduced some closed form expressions for what the orbits are doing there, which in principle might be observed in iron line type observations but I won't have time to talk about that today, though I'm happy to answer questions. And finally, let me conclude with my theorist's plea. There is still interesting general relativistic astrofluid dynamics that can be done with pencil and paper. And well, if you push me, I suppose a laptop, but don't give up on kind of old fashioned theory because you know that is still useful. We don't need supercomputers for quite everything, not just yet anyway. And I think I will end there. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry to have run over a bit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. That was great. And I very much approve you. of your of your advocation of uh, analytics. <laughs> so that was great. Uh, yeah. Are there any questions online or in the room? If so, put your virtual hand up. Ah, oh, Mike, yes. So uh, thanks for the very clear talk. So I was wondering about what the effect of winds would be. So I, in other regimes of disk physics, uh, winds are thought to possibly be as important for uh, removing angular momentum as vis viscous spreading. And I was wondering if uh, winds or jets would possibly have a similar effect here and would they change the uh would they change the model in a significant way or would it largely remain the same oh no i think they would charge they change the model in a significant way so winds are much more important i think in disks around early type stars than they are in black holes at least as far as carrying off the angular momentum goes so in um in disk theory the angular momentum in principle can be carried off uh, by a wind. That's more difficult to do around black holes because the disk is so turbulent and so active that the turbulent transport uh, is probably involved in at least a fair number of tidal disruption events. Accretion processes are complicated, and so there is no one model fits all. So um, there are, the other thing that the model ignores is that it doesn't take into account, you know, the jet. And if there is a strong jet, so, and a strong magnetic field, then you get into the whole question, disk theorists will recognize this as whether the disk is mad or sane. That is to say, magnetically arrested disks where the magnetic field becomes so large that it both blocks the accretion and you have direct accretion torques, or SANE, which I forget, standard and normal evolution, I think, which is a the idea that the model is proceeding along the lines that I'm giving here. So you, we do need, in order for this to work, we do need to have the uh, accretion 
um, in the disc being uh, dominated by the MRI. Certainly people who do things, who do full scale numerical studies of accretion discs, they don't get a huge amount of angular momentum carried off in the winds. The magnetorotational instability in the turbulent uh, tends to, to carry the day. So I would say at least for a lot of sources, we should be okay, but you're quite right to point it out that there will be cases uh, where we can't apply the model directly. That's kind of a long okay. answer to your question. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, we have one in the room from Sri. If you could speak up. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I was a little bit lost in the mathematics, but why would uh, there be a mass limit on what kind of black holes can do a tidal disruption event? So, for example, why is it that only a supermassive black hole be able to do a tidal disruption event? Because from what I understand, it, you just require a rotating black hole to be heavy enough, right? We don't need a rotating uh, black hole. It's just that the um, they are you, you just you don't you don't often have sort of black holes sitting in very star rich environments, uh, except if they're at the center of a galaxy where they tend to be uh, supermassive. If you have a stellar mass black hole, it tends to form, you know, a binary system. And so that's where you see it. Um, the uh, There's no particular, uh, mass where, I mean, in, in, to actually disrupt the star is kind of threading the needle in the phase space a little bit. And so the more massive stars, you have a little bit more room where you can disrupt the star uh, rather than sort of swallow. If the star, if the hole becomes massive enough, super massive, it tends to swallow it. Um, if it tends to get to be more like a 10 or 20 solar masses, then it's rather difficult to get it to come, you know, close enough so that you can tear it apart in, in just the right way. So the sort of 10 to the seventh to 10 to the ninth range is sort of statistically more likely to have these tidal disruption events. And those are kind of the sort of masses that you find in centers of galaxies. And it's also uh, kind of a stellar rich environment as well. Okay, uh, Martin, you have one online. Yes. Hello, uh, thanks for the very nice talk from me as well. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering <clears throat> about the um, the disk mass that you mentioned. So you mentioned you derive a disk mass of 0.2 solar For mass. For that particular case, yes. For that particular case? Yeah. Um, They're usually a little bit more, but for that particular case, it was a couple, yeah, 0.02. Yeah, what, what I didn't quite understand is why, so that appeared to be a constant in, in the theory. But I oh, would no. expect that some mass is accreting actually onto the black hole that's the initial okay. mass of the disk yeah all right so that's the initial mass of yes the yes that's, that does, that doesn't remain so this is not a this is not a steady theory this is an evolving theory so that was the initial i should have made that more clear yes thank you for asking and um i, I was also wondering what what's then the the end mass of the disk um so after the three years well after the three years you don't see anything so uh it uh a lot of it, I, I can't give you. I can't give you an answer for that because I don't have that number off the top of my of my head. But a lot of the disk goes out as well as coming in. in All right. In, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's it that that was basically my question. So, so it it, it really uh, uses up the disk entirely during that time. Pretty and, much. Pretty much. Yes. Okay. And a final question from Dom. Hi. Thanks also from me for a nice talk. Uh, I was wondering, right at the beginning of the TD event, yeah. uh, I believe that the accretion rates are generally expected, at least for some period of time, to be quite highly super Reddington. 
Mm. So then at that point, the vertical structure of your disc probably does make an impact. Is yeah, that, I wouldn't that... that's 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 an ex that's a fair point and an excellent point. So the the actual analysis that we're doing really is for the late time. So the you're right, early times you can be super Eddington, early times it's not even clear you have a disc present, you have a lot of fallback. So the early times in these TDs are very messy to model. People are interested in it uh, because uh, they're rather spectacular. They're extremely luminous. They have some regularities, which are also a bit peculiar. There tends to be a rather nice exponential fall off in the uh, X-ray emissions, which is not well understood. And there are certainly things going on which are not captured by the modeling which I've discussed today. But in some sense, to try and get at the black hole, you have to look at the boring stuff, which is when everything else has settled down and you're just sort of looking at the last little dregs spiraling around going into the hole. Those can be the most profitable to analyze, even though they're not the most spectacular part of the process observationally. I, I won't argue on with you on that point at all. I was just mostly just yeah double checking that this was intended for the late times where absolutely this is this is not meant again. to be the entire yeah the entire uh, process uh, and the when I showed you those curves where you had these plateaus in the ultraviolet that's only the late time behavior the early time behavior uh, at those wavelengths are there's uh, a much a much sharper exponential decline and then they plateau when the disk emerges right thanks sure okay so on that note uh, thank you very much again stephen well thank you thank you for inviting me and giving me the opportunity and, uh, thank you. at some point to be able to visit yes absolutely do let us know when that's possible okay. Very and good. to everyone else, have a good uh, Easter break, and to Stephen too, of course. Um, Thank and we'll you. See you for the next have a happy Easter to all. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.